Right, so uh, without any further delay, let me introduce you to our first presenter, Mark Barber. He's our Head of International Business Development for CHEM. Mark, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Saliza. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session. And thank you for attending. I'm going to give you um, a brief introduction to Kim with my colleague, uh, Lavanya. If you could put the slide on, Saliza, please. Thank you. So, um, Kem, the Centre for Evaluation and Monitoring, now part of uh, Cambridge. Um, this is an organogram about where Kem fits in. So, um, Kem came about around about 30 years ago as part of a research project as um, part of the University of Durham and started off about looking at um, how uh, research can inform teachers better about student progression um, so that changes can be affected in the classroom easier. Um, in uh, about one year ago, uh, the Cambridge assessment in a joint collaboration with the University Press um, bought CHEM from Durham and it now fits in as part of Cambridge CHEM. So um, it's the first time that Cambridge assessment and the press had uh, collaborated together on something of this scale. Um, so CHEM is there, um, is being uh, promoted and sold internationally uh, by our colleagues from both the press and Cambridge Assessment. And Cambridge Assessment, uh, of course, is um, the non-teaching uh, assessment board of the University of Cambridge, uh, comprising OCR, um, Oxford Cambridge, Royal Society of Arts in the UK, Cambridge International, and Cambridge English. And of course, the press renowned um, for many hundreds of years for its uh, resources to support um, academic Next slide, please, Saliza. So to understand the purpose of CHEM baseline, I think we need to, first of all, just remind ourselves about the purpose of assessment and what is assessment. Um, I think most of us, uh, particularly parents, um, would relate assessment to a high stakes test that we've all done at some stage in our life at the end of an academic program for which we receive a grade, which then facilitates access into higher education or employment. So we tend to say assessment of learning is assessment of learning that has hopefully taken place. We call it summative because it's too late to change uh, the outcome. Once the test is done, the test is done. And it is too late unless of course you have a retest to change the outcome of that high stakes exam. It's about seeing what the student can do um, not always along the lines of an academic curriculum, but indeed in any discipline that one has to do a, a test at the end of. When we think about assessment, it's important to think who it is about. And this is very much about the student, as I say. It's very much about a student because it accesses high stakes uh, exam that can access higher education or employment. And potentially uh, your outcomes in a school-based academic programme can affect the rest of your career progress throughout your life. It is a certi uh, certification of proficiency, and it might not just be an academic exam, it could be proficiency in swimming or life-saving or something like that, to say what you can do at that time. It is high stakes because it is used to determine that progression, and it is typically used at the end of a period or course of study. Again, that could be in anything. And increasing, as we see nowadays uh, in um, the global market, is it's used to compare a country's achievement uh, as against uh, a single class achievement in a school or a cohort or progression over years in a school or a system of education. So it's very much used as an international benchmark and hence it becomes even higher stakes. And of course, being higher stakes, that puts a lot of more pressure on all the stakeholders involved in it. Next slide, please. However, if we now look at assessment for learning, and that is assessment for the purpose of learning, the purpose and therefore the type of assessment changes. We move from summative to what's known as formative, and that it is forming opinions about a student's progress. It creates feedback, and that's very important. It creates feedback which can be used in good schools by good teachers to inform changes in the classroom. 
So it's about seeing as much as what the student can do as a watch what the student cannot do. And then, as I say, inform those changes to change the classroom practice. In this case, it is very much more about the teacher and the school rather than just the student. The student, of course, is very important because it informs on the student's progress. But the teacher becomes the most important player here because they can then put in place a program or change their scheme of work to adapt to an individual or cohort's progress. And that, in turn, will more likely determine the outcome in the high stakes assessment of learning at the end. It's typically low stakes because whilst it's used to return in a progression along a pathway, it is not typically used to um, give a, a defining verdict on a student which would affect higher education access or indeed career prospects. Although of course, as we've seen with COVID this year, is that um, predicted grades have been submitted by schools to examination boards, including Cambridge, which will be used to form their final grade assessment. Typically assessment for learning or formative assessment is used during a period of course or study and not at the end, although some elements of it do have a summative feel. For instance, at an end of week or end of term test will still have a defining element of pass and fail. When we talk about who it's about and we say the teacher as well as the student, it is important to remember that the student becomes very much part of the learning process. Whereas in a high stakes summative exam, the student then might leave a school and go on to other pastors new. In this event, it is a chance for the teacher and the student to have a discussion involving parents where necessary and for the student to take ownership of their learning progress. And this brings in metacognitive skills and the like for the learner to take responsibility for their own actions based on the teacher's analysis of where they are failing and where they are doing better. So in this case, it is the purpose of the assessment that is the important thing. Um, it is not the assessment that is uh, the tail that's wagging the dog in this instance. It is very much about a objective informed conversation. Next slide please. So we can sum this up in this very um, easy diagram here. And this is the same diagram you might apply for any rational evaluation of a situation in our life at school or even now. Where are you now? Where are you going? And how do you get there? In its simplest term, if I want to travel from A to B, I look at a roadmap or put my GPS on. Um, it will show me what I need to do to get where I want to be. And that's the same we need to apply when we look at assessment for learning. Next slide, please. So where does baseline assessment fit in all of this? Well, you'll have noticed that this slide is very similar to the previous one on assessment for learning, because baseline is, in fact, assessment for learning and has three key elements. The baseline part, the predictive part, which are looking forward, and then, as Lavania will talk about, the value added, which is looking back and linking the two places of where am I now? And where do I need to be? It is indeed formative. It's very formative because it is drawing a baseline in the sand to inform a student's strengths and weaknesses at an earlier stage than typical in course progression testing. It is very diagnostic in that way, as is assessment for learning. It is very much seeing about what the student can't do and informing changes earlier in the classroom. Again, it is very much about the teacher to enable the teacher at a far earlier stage to develop a scheme of work for a cohort or student um, that takes on board the evidence at a far earlier stage, typically at the beginning of a course of study. Now, some chem tests um, have an end of year test as well, where you can inform progress better, particularly in the younger years, but that's more important. But the difference between baseline and general formative assessment is baseline is generally used always before a period of course or study, as I say, to determine that line in the sand, that baseline measure of a student's strengths, but most importantly, perhaps their weaknesses as well, at an individual and cohort level. 
and that facilitates very powerful conversations between teachers, parents and the student themselves to determine their likely course of progression based on perhaps 30 years of data that CHEM holds on similar students and the school itself, if they've been using CHEM for many years, would have that baseline measure as well. To inform the conversation of if the learner continues at an expected path based on quite high probability statistics, the likelihood of outcomes in those high stakes exams will be shared between these grades. Only the student and the teacher and arguably the parent between them can change that course. Again, it is very much about the purpose of why this assessment is used rather than the pure nature of it. And when we look at CHEM baseline testing, we don't talk so much about what's in the test because it's impossible to prepare for the test. It's very much about looking what reports from the data, what statistical reports in a, in a range of different visualizations will a school have access to, and then helping them understand that to change classroom practices. So CHEM tests not an academic curriculum. It is, not, um, it is not tied to any academic curriculum. It is curriculum agnostic, as we call. So it can be used with any international or state curriculum in any international or government school. CHEM tests from uh, early years all the way through to post-16 up to the 19 years, literacy and numeracy as called baseline parts of a typical learning programme, but also bringing in things like non-verbal and skills, recognising shapes, matching patterns, spatial awareness, visual intuition, proofreading, perceptual speed and accuracy are all things that a broad cognitive ability test from CHEM will give. And using that depth of data, produce highly reliable statistical reports to allow schools to see how an individual or a cohort of learners is and is likely to progress. So it's a very powerful tool that can potentially at the beginning of a new academic year save three to four months from one to one teacher getting to know their student. Next slide please. So looking back at that previous uh, slide on oh, where am I now, where do I need to be, how do I get there, we can look at it again in this, where am I now, and how, how well might I do is the baseline predictive element of CHEM. How well am I doing is your more traditional formative assessment used um, by any uh, curriculum board, but also within base testing in CHEM, can be used as end of year testing as well. And then leading into the how well did I do summative assessment, which is your assessment of learning, which we talked about at the beginning. And you can see there that this draws up the whole picture of assessment from the beginning of a student's school career to the end and beyond in giving teachers, school leaders, parents and students themselves a complete holistic picture of their likely chances and enabling the best conversations and approaches to teaching and learning to be applied. Next slide please. So just to recap the purpose and value of CHEM baseline. It is a measure of a student's skill and aptitude at a given moment in time. It is certainly not a label for life and should never be seen as such. Uh, it is simply <clears throat> a baseline for measuring progress later on. You know where you are, you know where you need to be. It is a broad measure of knowledge. It is not dependent on any academic curriculum and can indeed be applied against any academic curriculum as well. As I have said, it saves time. Typically a teacher might need three to four months to get to know a student in the one-to-one. -one. Ken doesn't remove that, but it certainly facilitates um, some baseline measures that the teacher can use to save the time in getting to know each one of their students. And by highlighting the strengths, but more importantly, the weaknesses, enables those richer discussions as well. It is inclusive for all. It can accommodate <coughs> any type of student, any student from any background, um, any student with special educational needs as well can be factored for extra time, for instance, into chem tests. And the most important thing about chem testing is that these computerized tests are adaptive. They are easy to administer at school 
and as we have been doing um, in some special measures for COVID with home testing quickly and easily and the results are available normally within 48 hours maximum. Because they're adaptive, it means that the test gets progressively harder as the student progresses um, before, at and above their typical A standardised standard, uh, score. So stress is reduced um, because every test is unique. Every question that the student receives will be different from another student. It's from a massive uh, question bank and no time is therefore wasted in terms of marking, uh, by the teacher, standardising schools, etc. This is all done by CHEM and the reports released to schools electronically. Next slide, please. And what do those reports show? So, in summary, we have the baseline and predictive feedbacks, which give standardised scores, typically a mean of 100 with a standard deviation of 15, and 68% of scores will fall between 85 and 115. So that you can see over that, you've got the top 2% and below that, the bottom 2%. It gives individual pupil records as well as cohort profiles in all sections of the assessments, which have different elements depending on the product level. When we look at predictive, we can start at the secondary level is giving predictions to final exams based on that rich data over many years. A typical student progressing at that level uh, along a regressive line will achieve uh, on chances graphs this percentage will achieve this grade etc etc and that is where student and teacher intervention can help change those outcomes it is only predicting the chance of receiving a grade it is not saying that a student will receive that grade at all and it's presented in very different um, visualizations of um, statistical charts um, depending on what information you need and which is favoured by the teacher and the school for ease of access to that information. And then we look at progress and value added feedback which is rather the looking back stage is when you can take a student's actual scores in a high stakes summative assessment exam you can then <coughs> look back and what we call value add is the difference between what Ken predicted a student would achieve and what the student actually did achieve in a high stakes exam and looking at the factors that would influence that. And those factors can be brought in to determine a school's approach for subsequent consecutive cohorts. Next slide, please. So when do you use Chem Baseline? Well, um, ideally you would use at the beginning of an academic year or term. And as I say, with some junior testing at base, there is an end of year as well as a start of year report. It's very useful for students transitioning between different curriculum, courses and year groups. And particularly relevant at the moment as we look at teaching and learning when school returns as a cross single strategy initiative between all Cambridge brands, where there's gaps in knowledge for missed schooling. We know that when schools go back, whenever that might be, that there will be very different levels of attainment dependent on the situation that they found themselves, whether they've had internet access, access to technology, access to online learning. The very differences between different schools approach and access to online learning will be marked. And of course, what is missing evidence, a student moving from one country to study in another might be coming from a very different examination system. And this is a good opportunity to use Chem Baseline to find out a measure of what they can and cannot do. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, please do post them into the chat. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, our next presenter is Lavania, our Business Development Manager for CHEM in the Southeast Asia and Pacific region. Lavania, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salisa. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you for your time and participation in this webinar. I hope this will be a fruitful session. And before I can walk you through my presentation, I would just like to pose a poll question. Saliza. So yeah, what are the methods you use to gauge students level at the beginning of an academic year? Or after a gap in a classroom teaching, do you use any kind of baseline? Or any others apart from baseline? 
or there's just nothing that you use, please choose accordingly. And if you choose others, please post what are the methods or share them in the chat box. Thank you. Meanwhile, waiting for the poll, um, what are the things which I'm going to walk you through today? So I'll be talking mainly on water chem assessments. So now that you have a gist of what is baseline, what is that that we exactly offer? How is it integrated with uh, the Cambridge pathway? What is unique about chem and where do we exactly start? Thanks, Alisa, I think. We can, can we have the results for the poll? That's an interesting feedback. So we have about 55% who's doing baseline assessments. We have another 20% who does others. Please do share on the chat box if you don't mind on what are those uh, method do you use. And we also have 21% who's not using anything. So this would be a good session then. Uh, next slide, Saliza, thank you. So what exactly CAM offers? CAM offers a range of assessments which cater students from the age of three until 18. This gives you, uh, we have three assessment two taken at a preschool, which is aspects and base. In case is taken when they are at primary. Uh, followed by Mid-East at lower secondary, Yellis at higher secondary, and Alice uh, at any pre-university level. So they can be doing any kind of pre-university studies if they would want to take Alice. Uh, at the same time, like Mark mentioned just now, using CAM is like the assessment for learning tool. So it would give the teachers a good benchmark on the starting point, and certainly it may not give you all the answers, but it will help you ask better questions and the right question to enhance on the teaching and learning mechanism within your cohort and your school concepts. Can we move on? Next slide. Right, so now that CAM is part of Cambridge, um, it acts like a one-stop center where Cambridge is already offering a comprehensive curriculum alongside with the summative assessment CAM acts as a baseline or a formative assessment with a good range of resources offered by uh, CUP, Cambridge University Press, and that makes the execution of the syllabus very handy and easy. Now, apart from that, uh, how do we approach this? So we'll always tell students to take base before they can enter uh, the primary level. They take INCAS at the beginning, followed by the Cambridge curriculum of primary for, and end it with checkpoint. For Cambridge lower secondary, mid -east, uh, and uh, ended with se uh, lower secondary checkpoint at year nine and followed by YALIS for ICCSE and LS for A-levels. So uh, that's how it's integrated within the pathway. Can we move on, Salisa? So what is CHEM exactly used for? Now, based on my previous experience, being a school leader and an additional maths teacher, I always used to wonder what is the uh, numeracy level of my students, especially when I'm looking at a new cohort of students. And uh, I used to think I'll have all this kind of bubble questions popping out. Does my lesson today cater my entire cohort of students? Would I actually provide enough challenges to the brightest child? Meanwhile, cater the weak ones at the same time? Is my lesson being prepared to ensure there's proper differentiated learning mechanism incorporated? So yeah. So I always wish that I had kind of a map to navigate me through this process. So CAM is definitely a good map to tell you on which is the starting point, and it gives you alternative route on how to reach to an end point. So uh, it gives you a guidance on how to prepare your students accordingly, depending on their strengths and weaknesses. Mm. So. Uh, the main three components of a baseline test, it, it is for a diagnostic use. So it identifies students at their uh, strength and weaknesses, depending on where they are. And this really helps assessing the gaps when there is an absence from classroom. So despite having this pandemic situation and close school closure and so on, teachers have been working hard to deliver online uh, teaching. 
So we really hope when they come back to school, students have really utilized the online teaching and not put that to vain. Um, it is also good to be used at the start of an academic year and uh, to have a good brief overview and to ensure that all uh, a kind of material prepared is will cater that kind of a cohort of students and uh, nobody will know your students better than you do. Thus, the insight which we provide is definitely most powerful when you use it alongside with a teaching professional and to support your own judgment. And that's when magic really happens. Uh, apart from that, it also helps moving, transitioning from one educational phase to the other. So example, if you're having this year nine students who have issues uh, uh, picking their subjects on what they will possibly be doing in year 10, based on can also because it gives great predictions, it'll be helpful to gauge in that perspective. So moving on, target setting, the second point. This is very helpful for school leaders as well as uh, head of departments, where it helps you to move to the next step and uh, to build good, best and teaching practices on your learning plans to ensure that the student get uh, to a touching flying start and uh, they excel from wherever they are. The third part is reviewing progress. So this will be mainly used like a, a target setting. So this is done using the prediction, which is given from mid east uh, right up to Yellis and Alice. Uh, CAM assessment also provides a high quality objective measure of students' aptitude and skills at a single moment in time, thus becomes a very good measure of critical skills to access the entire curriculum at the start of academic year. Next slide, please, Eliza. So what is unique about CHEM? So if you see this kind of a triangular thing, uh, where am I now? Usually that's the question we ask, how do I close the gap and where am I going to? So in this regards, like what Mark mentioned just now, because CHEM is being adaptive, it, it is and curriculum agnostic, so it becomes personalized and every student uh, tend to look at their own set of questions depending on their strengths and weaknesses. And uh, since it is unlike the normal flat traditional test, where the normal flat traditional test, it gives you a mixed variety of easy, average and difficult question. So those who are bright enough, they would be done with the entire set of question and they'll be thinking, what do I have more to be challenged? Whereas the weaker ones will give up halfway and say, this is not the set of things which I'm looking at. So this all can be curved using CAM as it is unique. So it gives you a very specific goal on what is required to be reached by each student. And using the reports published by CAM, you'll be able to elevate the students from where they are to what they can achieve given a short duration of time frame. So keeping in mind now that school has been closed for a quite number of months, depending on different countries and region, when we get back to school and students are going to do the end of November series, we probably have about two to three months to prepare them thereafter. So Campbell definitely, the prediction which it gives, it will be a good uh, map and navigator, as well as will expedite the teaching and learning process in preparation for the November series, given the time factor into consideration. And it gives you a good benchmark on what exactly the methods you would overlay in order to show the kids the right pathway. I also strongly believe knowing a student tip is very important. You know, what do I mean by the word tip? Uh, tip stands for T for talent, I for interest, and P for potential. So CAM definitely unveils all these three points and uh, it gives you on how to move to the next step. And the next slide, please, Eliza. So yes, that ends kind of my presentation. I would just leave you with the following questions. So being a teacher, uh, think about the student assessment results. So once you get this kind of results from CAM, do you decide on students' capability on what students need to learn? Or instead, you identify how well they have thought something and what uh, they as teachers need to learn. Whichever stand you take, it's time to think on which exactly you do. And it's definitely time to teach on purpose. So uh, CAM will give you the right pathway in order to bring the child from where they are to where they would be. Thank you. And uh, I would pass on to see to the presenters from the school to share their experience on how CAM has helped them through the process. Please leave your question and answer session at the end. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Lavanya. I would now like to introduce Hamish, uh, Assistant Head of Secondary for Student Outcomes at College Tuan Kuchatfa. Hamish, over to you, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Saliza. Um, yeah, if we can just start on the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so, thanks again, Saliza. I'm Hamish Farkson, the Assistant Head of Secondary for Student Outcomes at College Tuanku Jathar in Malaysia. If I can start with a little bit about our current context, we are in ages 3 to 19 uh, not for profit boarding school, about 400 kilo uh, sorry, 40 kilometers south of Kuala Lumpur in uh, Negri Sembilan State. We have about 77% Malaysian students with just shy of 800 students in the secondary school, most of whom are boarders. We have pretty high academic standards, 72% A star to A grade students, uh, A grades at A level in 2019, which has brought quite specific challenges during the period of online learning in terms of managing different levels of motivation, for example. We moved to online learning on the 17th of March and had initially hoped to keep boarding facilities open for overseas students and those who were due to sit exams. However, the situation rapidly changed and the boarding department had to scramble to source flights to uh, various countries. There are a few cases of children being turned back from the airport because of last minute flight cancellations and other travel uncertainties. Because of the dispersed nature of our student body, only about 50 students in year 10 and lower six could officially uh, could return for the officially sanctioned reopening on the 24th of June, before we finished again for the summer holidays on the 3rd of July. Our anticipated full return is the 1st of September. We currently use Yellis and Alice to set subject-specific predicted rates for IGCSE AS and A-level students. These are used by heads of department and teachers as the basis for their targets. But it's important to comment though that this is a best guess rather than a locked-in prediction. And I will talk a little later about how we intend to use the prediction element of Yellis and Alice to support students as they return to school. But the other important element in target setting is of course teacher judgment. Uh, for whatever reason, there are a few cases where students' Yellis predictions vary from alternative data, such as uh, classroom assessment. So the lived experience, as it were, of teacher judgment is essential. In addition to the use of predicted grades throughout our students' IGCSC and uh, GCE courses, we also use the value-added analysis uh, tool post-exams to monitor student performance, to evaluate successful strategies, and to provide support where necessary to staff and students. We also compare ongoing assessment data against progress made towards their targets this way. And we will continue to do so after our return to school. Uh, next slide, please. So moving forward, there are two key elements that will be really useful post home learning when we return on the 1st of September. I will also admit right away that none of these ideas are entirely original, but they're all gleaned from other CAM and Cambridge assessment, blog posts, webinars. For those who are not using CAM products at the moment, this for me is a really strong feature of CAM, um, as well as the fact that they have a track record of being linked to uh, first class universities, as Mark mentioned, initially at the University of Durham's Faculty of Education, and more recently with Cambridge University through Cambridge Assessment. And at the end of my presentation, I've included a few QR links to useful resources that have helped me in this way. Anyway, the elements which will really be able to enhance our provision and support for all our students are the individual pupil records and the chances graphs. The first facility in the CHEM suite that we will really utilize uh, is making more effective use of individual pupil records. As most of our students may well have been away from wider human contact outside their immediate families for up to 166 days, 
we are all very aware that nurturing them once they return to school is crucial. The traditional post-summer holiday learning dip will be proportionally amplified as well, both by time and the isolation that we have all had to endure. Focused mentor or tutor sessions are a perfect opportunity to really share and discuss IPRs with students. But it is also something that can be effectively used within departments and by class teachers to spot students who may have struggled, fallen behind, or develop gaps in their knowledge. And I look a little closer at this in the next two slides. What will be really important though, in making sure that every student catches up to where they are meant to be, is a much closer integration between analyses of target data, standardised scores within the chem assessments, and ongoing class data. And before I look at some examples, I'd like to emphasise this idea of integration of different data sets as being really essential uh, to how we use the information at our disposal. When we talk about the title of this webinar, Assessing Gaps in Learning Using Chem Baseline Assessment, the assessment data we have has not changed magically over the home learning period. It just helps us to understand our students in comparison to where they actually are and where they would ordinarily have been. So here's an example of an IPR on the right hand side. Um, given standardized assessments examine a student's innate ability, more effective analysis of IPRs and standardized assessments can highlight areas in which a student, uh, which a student may have neglected during their time away from school. Of course, this might not be the case, but it is important to, to compare class data to see if it is true and then provide additional support where necessary. In this example I've highlighted here, Andrea's maths strand is weaker. So perhaps he will have subconsciously neglected STEM areas. And in collaboration with tutor discussions, then we can put in place extra support. Of course, his performance itself is not weak, but it is weaker than other areas. Conversely, this example is quite common for a number of our students, and I would imagine in international schools across the region, where the vocab score is very much lower than the maths and pattern scores. So in this IPR, Julio's IPR has a pretty common pattern for EAL students. And this pattern is quite good for differentiating between students who are struggling because of EAL or struggling because of some other factors. So his vocabulary score is much lower, lower than the maths and patterns score highlighted by the green. In this particular situation, post online learning, all our students will have been spending four and a half months in an environment where opportunities for the social practice of speaking and reading English are limited. And so these students will almost be doubly impacted. Um, there's another great example I can pull up here, a year nine, uh, Japanese boy, Shinsuke, let's say, who was initially identified based on standardized data as benefiting from a transferable skills program we run for weaker students in place of an IGCSE. After looking at attainment data from term one and two, it was actually felt that he had made sufficient progress not to need this intervention. But during the home, line, home learning period, he has really struggled and so will be following the transferable skills course. Two important reasons he said that he was struggling was because of language understanding and isolation. He, was, he is quite a sociable boy and he talked and practiced English constantly in a social and academic setting. Whereas back in Japan, his, uh, whereas when he was back in Japan, he, his family do not speak strong English and so his opportunities to speak and practice his English were lessened. Finally, with regards to IPRs, I just wanted to re-emphasize uh, re that they and all data must always be seen as part of a bigger picture. Standardized scores and predicted grades are indicators, but teachers need to combine this with accurate assessment. 
I joined in one of the principal's teacher, uh, sorry, principal's training center teacher leader webinars two weeks ago, which follow, uh, focused on assessment. One particular one that stood out for me was their discussion of moderation. And I thought in this context, it is particularly relevant. And it is part of this process of discussion that IPRs come into their own. No data, whether CAM class assessment or more formal summative assessment, should be taken as a standalone data set, but should be moderated and discussed within departments, year groups, and between class teachers. And this kind of goes back to uh, Mark's presentation right at the start. The other element of CHEM assessment that will be particularly useful in school after we return are the chances graphs. By the time we anticipate returning to face-to-face -face teaching on the 1st of September, as I've already said, we will have spent 166 days away from school. Consequently, the need to mentor and nurture our students back into the routine of class, homework and independent study is greater than ever. One useful tool for these conversations will be the chances graphs. Uh, one argument against sharing predicted grades and against sharing targets is that it can act as a limiter to aspiration as well as a target. And so the use of chances graphs as opposed to discrete predicted grades is a great way to promote a growth mindset at any time, but particularly after a period of inertia. In this example, the predicted grade for this student is a C. There's a 32% chance of getting a grade C, but whilst it is the highest specific chance, there is also a 43% combined chance of him getting a grade B or higher. So when carefully used in a mentor or tutor conversation, this can be a really powerful tool to promote positivity. Developing on this in the next uh, slide. Finally, with regard to the IPRs, uh, sorry, with regard to the chances graphs, I just want to re-emphasize that they and all data, no, sorry, um, getting mixed up here a little bit, sorry. On the Yellis prediction spreadsheet, it is quite easy to set up a print-off that just selects the actual subjects that students take. This could easily be done by mentors or tutors, and so share the whole range of subjects that Yellis has assessed for a specific student. As you can see from this slide, there are some subjects that the top two probabilities are really quite close. Again though, when you combine the probabilities of higher grades, it becomes quite a powerful motivational tool to spur students on and remind them of what they are capable of. Final slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned at the start of my presentation, these links are just to show off some sources that I have used and uh, found to be of value in developing my understanding. The Chem blog is well worth looking at. There are lots of articles and guidance that have really helped inform my plans over the years and particularly in this context. The Chem Vimeo channel also has a lot of past webinars, conference talks and so on that are very useful and thought provoking. Top 10 tips is my personal favorite recent blog post from Chem over the past few months. So I thought I'd share it with you all now. And finally, evidence-based education provides training on various elements of Chem assessment that can be brought in to understand, support and support understanding. There are also some other good short courses about different elements of assessment that are useful there too. There are also a few short videos on the CHEM Secondary Secure page produced by Evidence-Based Education that are really useful in visualizing how the standardized assessments work. These can be shown to staff, for example, who are unfamiliar with how CHEM computer-based assessment tests work. So thanks for listening. I hope this will either give some ideas for making better use of a whole range of chem features, 
or indeed an affirmation of what you already do and where you already are in the chem process. Ultimately, I believe it will make a difference to student learning through better staff awareness of student ability and also increased student motivation, I hope. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Hamish. Um, next, please let me introduce Robert. He's the Director of Studies from Harrow Bangkok International School in Thailand. Robert, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salisa, and good afternoon to everyone from Bangkok. I work at Harrow International School here in Bangkok, and I'm going to be offering you a little context about the school. Then I will explain how we currently use CHEM, how we'd like to use it, and finally, how we can respond to the school closures we and all of our students have been experiencing. So a little bit of school context. We're a through school. Um, however, I'm the director of studies for the upper school, which is year six through to year 13. We are an international school, which has been running for 20 odd years. The student body is predominantly Thai in composition. Our year groups in the top end of the school can fluctuate between late 80s and 130, but recently around 110. Our results see our GCSE grades come in between 65, 67% A star A and around 60% A star A at A level. We achieve a very high level of value added at the school, um, something that was referred to earlier on by Mark. We've now been using CHEM for many years, but there are still more ways in which we can use it, which I will talk about later. So, um, Salisa, perhaps if you could just move to the next slide, how we currently use CHEM. Well, essentially we use YELIS and ALICE, but not MIDIUS. Uh, we're not dogmatic in their use. We very much modify it to our context to make it work for us. We've used the concept of the 50th and 75th percentile and modified it to suit our own con context insofar as we've created a 90th percentile to raise the baseline against which we assess in assignments, reporting stages, and all other outcomes. Additionally, the 90th is used to inform more ambitious student target grades in combination with teachers' judgment. Uh, I think you uh, have heard a lot of the features of CHEM so far, but here's one more, intake profiles. We found these to be particularly useful they allow us to develop strategic insights into relative strengths of year groups comparatively. Uh, this informs cohort targets for public examination and is one of the means by which we will be assessing school closure impact when compared with what we call grade card reports at the end of term 1A in October. This year, chem data has been particularly useful for us and I'm sure for any of you who've already bought into it, to check our predicted grades and that they are in line not only with the departmental level evidence that exists, but also these statistical indicators. They have also, of course, been identified by boards as an effective feature of evidence in grade prediction for the June 2020 session. We use ALICE in a particular way to inform uh, A-level um, while many schools favour the computer adaptive baseline testing as a strong indication of A-level outcomes, we found that the average IGCSE scores are usually a more accurate indicator. Of course, this is not the case with new subjects at post-16. So, for example, we offer media studies, psychology and so on, and we do consult there the computer adaptive baseline testing results. What all of this is revealing is that there's not a one size fits all approach to the way we employ and apply the data. And I commend that approach to you all. So is chem data used at Harrow just to inform targets? Well, no, uh, it's regularly referred to in both reports and parents evenings, for example. I remind all teachers in the instructions um, that go out prior to report writing 
that comments and grades should take the available chem data into consideration. This approach provides the reassurance that our commentary is unaffected by recent peaks and troughs in student teacher rapport or by the most recent test score. We've seen how effective the use of chem data can be to inform parents' expectations of their child because of the objectivity it offers. It additionally affords a sense of overview in terms of broader attributes that affect groups of subjects or particular skills within individual subjects. For example, identification of levels of proficiency outlined through vocabulary scores allows us to identify that in maths, for example, students can be challenged by the language or terminology of the question rather than the complexity of the problem itself. Chem data is also helpful insofar as it can inform interventions through consideration of scores in individual pupil records, which um, Hamish has talked about at length already, so I'll brush over that in a little bit more speed. Um, but as you'll be aware already, individual pupil records provide the kind of granular detail on each of the scores within the respective test that offers teachers, students and parents not only a baseline, but also an indication of key individual strengths of the student. At Harrow Bangkok, we are currently in the process of becoming a high performance learning school. In a nutshell, HPL identifies that success is born out of a combination of potential, motivation and opportunity. So how does this link with chem? Well, we're still finessing this, but the obvious link of positive reinforcement that it offers will be through highlighting that chem data reveals potential rather than limitation or weakness. The appreciation by students and parents of the use of the data for their benefit is crucial in its impact and I think can mitigate some of the stress currently felt by the students if used in a positive way. Hamish, for example, has already referred to growth mindset, which is something that we feel is crucially important. I referred earlier to individual pupil records um, and now I'd like to talk about how we would like to use CHEM in future. So, Salisa, if you could uh, move to the next exceptionally detailed slide. So, yeah, we want to use IPR more, individual pupil records. We've looked into printing these with the regular port reports that are provided to parents and students. However, Currently, these are not so easy to share through our MIS, but that is something that we definitely want to develop. Uh, currently, chances graphs uh, are also underutilized. Chances graphs show the probability of achieving a grade according to grades achieved by students in the past with the same chem score. We think this can be potentially motivational. Again, as I say, if combined with a growth mindset, and sits very well with our move towards high performance learning. And we're thinking to incorporate these into parents' evenings. Additionally, we would like to work more with CHEM to find out if there's a second language learner deficit that is or can be factored into the baseline data. And I'm sure this is a feature um, of interest to many other international schools. We would like to make our analysis of our value added sharper. Gender analysis is of course fairly straightforward, but looking at our day versus boarding students will be particularly useful, especially in light of the fact international boarders have and will be more affected by school closure. So um, I guess really we get to the nuts and bolts of what this uh, webinar is all about. And if we move to the next slide, it's to ask the question, how we can overcome the gaps created by school closure. Uh, so, Salisa, if you could move to uh, that. Thank you very much. When setting up assessment for the return to school and specifically in response to school closures, there's a really important set of questions to ask here. Firstly, what is the purpose of your assessments? You know, for example, are you using a test or assessment task for its impact on learning? to provide high level monitoring as an overview or to inform specific classroom decisions. 
Next question that's really important is what you will do as an outcome of the assessment. In other words, what interventions or support will take place? It's all very well becoming laden with data, but the key is how do you then utilize it? Finally, have you established an effective balance between deploying standardized assessment and more detailed subject specific formative assessment? Again, these are points that uh, Mark and Hamish have already raised. So I think maybe the best thing I can do is just move on to the specific steps that we've taken so far to mitigate the concerns about gaps in learning. Well, one of the things that we're doing is bringing forward mock examinations and moving away from the model of finishing the course and then doing a trial exam. We feel that the mocks need to be far more formative than that in the current context. We will also be utilizing low key and frequent quizzing, low stakes testing as referred to earlier um, by Mark to ensure that stress levels for students are limited but useful and granular detail is collected. I really like the point made by um, Professor Dan Willingham. Memory is the residue of thought. This reminds us that the assessment we undertake should be thought provoking. In other words, focusing on learning rather than purely performance. After all, when we plan spaced repetition, it should be with a view to revisiting old topics or skills, but in a freshly challenging way. I'd also like to highlight the importance we stress on the feedback loop. Encourage your teachers to frequently request feedback from students. The insights are not only hugely beneficial to their teaching practice, but I feel give the students a hugely important role in their educational journey. The sense of being listened to and understanding that then small tweaks have been made to the way they learn is exceptionally empowering. But here's the thing, how do we cover the content, ensure skills progression and assess, now we're under more time pressure than ever before? Well, I think this is where you need to ensure that your heads of faculty or heads of department are really effective in their use of data. Mark sheets or mark books are not just to be records of achievement but need to keep chem data highly visible. They need to be triggers for the next step and the next step must be tailored to the content or skills gap your assessment has revealed in line with that baseline testing. In other words, the next assignment must reflect that and be tailored to the need. In that way, our response to student need is informed, precise, and targeted. It has to be to ensure that students who have fallen behind are truly supported. I will end on the news story reported earlier in the week, which has highlighted the requests by a body of head teachers for the exam boards to consider the design and content of the exams themselves in the 2021 session as a response to the very issue we're discussing. There are things after all that schools can do to mitigate the problems in using chem data and adapting their teaching techniques, but I also look forward to the development of the board's response also. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Robert and Hamish. Thank you for the excellent presentation and sharing session. So I'll just end it with a kind of conclusion on what did we look at today. So base chem as a baseline. So it provides you to ask the right question and identify the right starting point, uh, what exactly chem assessments offers. So we looked at it at the beginning and the kind of sharing session, which is done by Hamish and Robert on how CAM has been incorporated into their specific teaching and learning mecha mechanism within their each cohort of their schools and how baseline can contribute towards grade prediction and subject options. So next slide please, Aliza. So we have had a trail of pre questions posted prior to this session, which I have kind of uh, consolidated and tabulated. 
and we will also look at some live questions. So you can start posting your live question on the Q&A box, please. And uh, we will look at a, a few pre-questions before we could go to the live questions. So as of the pre-questions, there was any payment involved. I would take this question as uh, you would be able to view the payment list for each test on chem.org, cem.org website. So if you go to that website, you'll be able to see the lineup of assessment which is offered and the kind of pricing. It is priced per student, per pupil. Uh, how do I avoid plagiarism when it comes to computer-based assessment? Um, now, when it comes to CAM, because it's adaptive, uh, a few individuals sitting for the test at the same time would be looking at different screens. So I don't think we have to think about plagiarism at this point of time. I would also like to look at a variety of questions for all levels. Um, please do drop me an email. You would see my email address at the end. So I could walk you through more specifically on each assessment. The fourth one, how a baseline can effectively monitor students' progress during a lockdown. Uh, Hamish, Robert, and Mark have actually shared in regards of that. And uh, Robert did speak a bit more in, in depth in regards of how that can be done. So is CAM part of Cambridge exams? Mark, would you want to take this? There's a few in regards of this on the chat box. Assessment. Yeah, thanks, Savannah. I, I did see a comment. Why why isn't uh, why doesn't Cambridge Assessment International Education include Chem in their in their exams and include in total exam fee from Salim at uh, SAS Group of Skills? Um, you know, we're looking at looking at all things, but Salim, it's important to remember that um, whilst Chem is part of Cambridge, uh, as it was part of Durham, uh, it actually works with um, agnostically with exam boards around the world. So. So, um, you know, we have to be careful about pairing it too closely to Cambridge, but that's a very good point. Um, and believe me, discussions are going on inside on that. Um, so, so sorry, Levani, I sort of bypassed my own um, train of thought on the question. No problem. They were actually asking if CAM is part of Cambridge exams. That was a few queries. No, no, it's not. It is part of Cambridge assessment, which is a non-teaching arm of the university and the university press, which, which, which have jointly acquired it from Durham. Right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, what is the best assessment for young learners? So uh, if you look at my presentation, I did lay out that we have SPACs, BASE and INCAS, which runs from the age of three right up to the age of uh, six. So that would be a good benchmark for the young learners. How do we prepare the students for baseline? Mm. Mark, would you want to take that? <laughs> Well, I think the important thing is is you don't and you shouldn't um, because it would rather defeat the purpose of the test. I mean, um, certainly, you know, I, I remember when I was uh, in international schools in Africa um, and, and dealing a lot with, with parents. Um, it, it is a difficult concept for parents to understand, I think, the difference between the, the high stakes summative assessment exams, which you know, is crucial that the student gets as, as performs their ability. On the other end of the scale with baseline, it, it's important, and I, I'm sure, sure Hamish and Robert would agree with me here, that the school gets the absolute objective picture of the student's strengths and weaknesses. Um, and anything that's done uh, through plagiarism or, or home testing or inter external interference to try and um, taint what the student's abilities are is actually acting against the best interests of the students and indeed the teachers and the schools. Can I just interrupt here as well briefly? Yes, please, Hamish, thank you. I found that, of course, it's impossible to prepare the students for chem baseline assessments. However, it is really important to prepare them and uh, emphasize the importance of the assessment. Um, if they don't take it seriously, and, <clears throat> and it's just portrayed as a computer-based test, then obviously that skews the results. So it's very important to emphasize the importance of how it fits into the whole package of assessment. Excellent. Thanks, Hamish. Um, is CAM accredited, acknowledged worldwide? Mark. Sorry, Levanya, give me the question again. Is CAM accredited or acknowledged worldwide? Uh, well, it's, it's accredited. Um, it is certainly used by some uh, ministries and departments of education 
around the world. Uh, we work, we do work with ministries, groups of schools and associates uh, around the globe. Um, so yes, in different countries, it is recognized. Um, it is not centrally accredited as such. I mean, in, in the UK, for instance, um, it is, it is not, um, it is not part of uh, off call or anything like that. Um, but then nor are Cambridge exams, international exams. Thanks, Mark. Um, how can we use baseline to handle a class of multi-intelligent students? Uh, Robert Dahamish, would you want to share on that? Uh, Robert? I can, I can say a little bit about that right. as well. Right. Um, Thanks, I think the, the most useful feature is having a good awareness of the standardized scores. Um, so the different, the different strands, vocab, uh, maths and patterns, that presents a, a picture of the different abilities of the students. And so one of the examples I had, for example, which is quite a common example with EAL students, is where the vocab score is considerably lower than the uh, maths and the pattern score. And this is an indicator that they could well be EAL students. Thanks, Hamish. And where are you uh, blog or CM pages, there is a really useful guide as to how the different combinations and permutations of the standardized score strands kind of appear in terms of different students. Excellent. Thanks, Hamish. Robert, anything to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Hamish there, really, to be honest. Um, to be fair, it's, it's just a, a further insight into the qualities, the learning abilities of your students. And it's not going to be the only one you use, but it's definitely very useful in providing, as Hamish has pointed out, those um, quite clear disparities that it sometimes sets up uh, between, for example, vocabulary scores and math scores. As I pointed out in my presentation, you know, we, we were quite interested to find that the maths problems that the kids were trying to solve were an absolute cinch for them. They were totally easy for them if they were just represented numerically. But as soon as they were presented within a problem that is verbalized, that's when they had an issue. And it's those sorts of things that are really important in making sure that you uh, deliver a level of education to your students that gains them the outcomes that they require. Thank you, Robert. Um... We'll move on to the live questions, and those were the pre-questions which were sent prior. Uh, please post any question on the Q&A. If you don't have enough time, we would address it after the session. And that's my email address. For any further question, please drop me an email. So let's move on to that. Questions on chat. Q&A. Uh, how much is CAM for Alice? The price can be checked on the website, as we mentioned just now. Uh, Mark, this question is for you. Uh, can students proceed ASA level without taking IGCSE level? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely they can. There's no, no obligation within uh, Cambridge uh, assessment pathway to have completed IG before you attempt A levels. Right. Thanks, Mark. Um, can CAM Yellis be used for science subject when the strength is above 20 students? Hamish or Robert, you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking. Does that mean the strength within the school and within the cohort or within a class? Uh, I believe it's within the school, if, if they're looking at a science subject in particular or science students, maybe. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure because uh, the strength of our cohort is much higher, but I presume Whenever you have a, a you know a narrow data set, then um, you know the, the the outcomes are going to be slightly uh, less convincing. But uh, I'll pass that one over to Hamish. Right. Yeah, I think um, you might be thinking in the context of your own school with twenty students, for example. However, there are hundreds of thousands of students who do chem assessments around the world, and the feedback all comes out of a wider algorithm that looks at this greater body of students. So I think from my experience, you can certainly do it with a smaller group of students. 
because it all feeds off the wider body, as it were. Excellent. Thank you, Hamish and Robin. Um, Mark, would you want to take this? Is there a trial for chem that we can use? I think there's a couple of questions on trials before they can take on chem. No, there isn't. A, there isn't a trial as such that we give schools. Uh, I think the best way to um, is, is to contact your local representative, Lavania, uh, and and discuss the reports and the test with Lavania. The, the the problem with trials, as Kem has at the moment, is that um, we very we're very conscious that we don't want to dilute um, the the database, the data lake where all the information from these thirty years is is going into. Um, by using trials if the test isn't taken in anger so to speak as Hamish mentioned um, there's a danger that uh, we, we could corrupt the, uh, the, the the wealth of information we have um, certainly it is something we want to develop is is a, a sort of web-based trial that uh, people can see in examples of the tests but the way forward at the moment is please contact Lavania and uh, her and her team will be very happy to uh, share examples with you. Right thanks Mark just on the same note would you be able to address is CHEM the same as Checkpoint or what is the difference between them? Uh, no, okay, so um, Checkpoint is indeed within primary, lower, secondary, a progression test, a, a formative type of assessment, but it does have a summative element in that the progression testing is typically taken at the end of the academic term um, and, uh, and therefore sort of is looking at what the student has learned. Um, CHEM, on the other hand, is being used to inform what the student's uh, line in the sand is at the beginning of the academic year. And of course, Checkpoint is aligned to the Cambridge International Primary and Lower Secondary Academic Curriculum, and CHEM is looking at a far broader range of skills. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's one question, either Hamish or uh, Robert, you can take it. The question says that... Um, mm, Sorry, I just missed it. <laughs> yeah, which element in the CHEM data is best used to help your student choose subjects when they move on from year nine to year 10 and the kind of prediction used for IGCSE? Um, Hamish or Robert, either of you would want to take it? Okay, so um, with regard to this question, um, clearly when you're looking at the individual pupil records, and you're able to highlight vocabulary skills and you're able to highlight mathematical skills, then those will be the sorts of uh, features of data that would provide you with um, a further source of information to advise students. I think the thing is it's not on its own authoritative, it's supportive of what you as teachers possess within your professional judgment and your knowledge of the student. However, in supporting that professional judgment, what it provides is something which uh, both Mark and myself have mentioned is objectivity. Um, so there's no sense, if you like, that the chem data is uh, anything other than straight down the line. It's not going to be a situation where, for example, department heads are looking to grow numbers in their uh, subjects and, and trying to recruit everybody they can. It's very simply a case of here's the information. This supports what I know about you as a student. Thanks, Robert. And we'll get the last question. Sorry that we're running out of time. Uh, Mark, could you please address this? Does CAM, CAM includes all the subjects in IGCSE or AS and A levels for predictions? Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't. It doesn't include all. It predicts to the majority. Um, the we can only predict to um, subjects that have a minimum entry cohort. Um, so the predictions uh, are perhaps more accurate to for the for high entry subjects. But nevertheless, Chem can predict to drama and art and design. Uh, for instance, uh, which might seem a bit odd, but uh, nevertheless, it does exist. Um, Lavania, I think uh, there, there, there is a list, if it's not on the website, you would have a list of the subjects to which right. we can predict too. Yes, we do. Um, so for more further questions, for those which we have not answered, I apologize that we have overshooted by time. I would definitely get back on those questions to you. And uh, just there was one more, which uh, I was looking at. Uh, just to clarify, CAM is a computer-based assessment test, so we don't really, it's not a paper-based test. 
and uh, that's how it is being adapted. There's a few questions on that as well, uh, just to clarify that point. And any questions you have, please drop me an email and I'll uh, assist you there on. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And we really, really hope that this session has given you a lot of information and a kind of fruitful session on what is baseline, how can and how. And thank you for the sharing session from the schools by Hamish and Robert. Thanks, Mark, as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. And thank you, Saliza, to moderate the session.